Hi, Christopher Millard. Good morning, Leo Roseman. <laughs> I'm so glad you agreed to do this. So I have to say, I know you well as a colleague, such an inspiring colleague. I think you're an incredible musician and such a beautiful bassoon sound and your phrasing and your timing. And you always ask great, uh, very pointed questions to the conductors. I really <laughs> <laughs> enjoy that. So we're going to talk so much about your career as a bassoonist, but you have sure. done so many things. And I want to start with a podcast because this is a podcast. And I remember very well when you said to me, you're very excited you're going to be doing this podcast. I think it must have been 2006 or, or late 2005. And I said to mm -hmm. you, what's a podcast? Because <laughs> it was very new then, actually. Pa mm -hmm. Podcast kind of started in 2004. Most of us, you know, we had just bought a computer. We didn't have any of these devices. It's hard for people who are younger now to appreciate how new this was. And I remember you were very excited and you said, people can listen to this at any time from anywhere in the world. It's much better mm -hmm. than radio. Mm -hmm. And I, I was re-listening to some of the episodes I missed because I had young children at the time when you were making these <laughs> early episodes. And I will point in the description of this episode, I'll, I'll actually put links to the specific episodes I think people will find very interesting. Like you did one about deep practicing. I think you called it practice makes perfect. Okay. Which I, I think remember really, that. Yes, yeah. very, re very relevant to all musicians, not just. You know, it was a curious process, Leah, because the, um, the new media department, the National Arts Center came to me and it wasn't all that long after I had started with the orchestra in 2004. And for whatever reason, they were looking for uh, some sort of a willing victim to take on this experiment of figuring out what the heck is a classical and orchestrally focused podcast going to be. And honestly, um, I should say that over a few years, we did, I think, 65 episodes. It was a lot of content, but we certainly started out at the very beginning. It was kind of designed as a promo for upcoming concerts. Mm -hmm. That's how it was conceived. But very quickly, I realized that I'm not sure that that was particularly valuable and certainly wasn't of particular interest to me. And so they gave me kind of free reign, uh, both in terms of content and in terms of utilizing our dear technical expert, um, Martin Jones at the at the Art Center, who was just so willing to do deep dives with me into a lot of editing and a lot of creative stuff. So uh, yeah, it was it was very interesting and quite surprising to me um, after the first year that I would hear from people all over. I mean, there, there were thousands of people downloading this thing, probably because there was so little competition for anything at that time. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good adventure. And just as you have been discovering in the last year in doing your own video casts and podcasting, you understand what an amazing outlet it, it is for our creative, our cognitive uh, disciplines and adventures and interests. I mean, it really does that, that having to organize uh, beforehand, especially an improvised conversation with someone, uh, it takes a kind of a, a of a, not just pre-planning, but a, a willingness to go with whatever nutty thing your guest might have to say. So you address that uh, particular practice makes perfect. That was one of a whole series of, of podcasts that I did where I was trying to I don't know, touch upon pedagogical uh, mm -hmm. content. Yeah, and another one, um, like you did the clown of the orchestra all about the bassoon. Mm -hmm. And although we'll be talking about the bassoon in this conversation, I will point to that episode is so great to people who really want to learn more mm -hmm. and hear you play all kinds of excerpts and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I think the one you're st you had your students do when you were teaching at Northwestern University mm -hmm. hijacked, it was really interesting to hear them uh, talk and play. And also they talked about many of them are double majors and um, you know at academic institutions I think more and more music majors are taking that role that route and you had a very opposite experience you know you went to Curtis Conservatory and didn't even spend that long there because you got your first job so young yes so yeah. yeah what do you think about that in terms of young people starting out now well, of course, we are living, uh, if we just discount the last year and a half and just yeah. don't even think about the pandemic, if you had asked me this question two years ago, I would have answered it uh, in a slightly more generous way than I would even now. And that would have been to say that we have the reality of 
ridiculous numbers of uh, orchestral instrument students graduating from good schools at very high levels every year and extremely small uh, vacancies. Yeah. They're very, it's, it's very difficult. So this was always true. Um, it was certainly true <clears throat> if you had asked me two years ago. And if you ask me now, I think we are um, perhaps in a, in a even more problematic period, although perhaps temporarily, and that has to do with the fact that many auditions are not happening because as orchestras start to regather their strength and uh, and start to schedule more normally and look towards uh, a season next year that that's a little bit more typical um, one of the things that's happened is that a lot of people my age have made a decision that it's time to retire and and so there are many openings and in fact in most orchestras there are so many openings that they cannot be filled in one year mm. So, uh, the, but the thrust of your question is about the teaching of double majors, which is a concept I've always loved and supported. Mm -hmm. And there's, apart from the obvious reason that you are uh, perhaps less concerned about the outcome of a particular student because you know that uh, their alternative educational pursuits are more likely to lead to an employable situation, mm -hmm. and whatever that means, because it's certainly at, when I was in my twenties and studying, careers were intended to be lifelong. And over the decades, as we've seen, uh, younger generations now tend to, to move from career to career, and a different skill set is required. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to the second part of why I love the double degree, is that I do think that if you view the music performance aspect of a double degree student's work as being an exercise in helping them develop uh, cognitive skills that cross between reductionist and holistic thinking, where they learn, um, they learn disciplines, certainly about how to organize their time and, you know, musical instruments are, do require enormous uh, personal discipline. Mm -hmm. But even deeper than that, I think that they, uh, if, if you help them, you encourage them to see uh, whatever particular re kind of reductionist thinking you may be using in pulling apart a passage musically or technically, is really just representative of a skill set which is applicable to many things, and certainly not just to, to music but into their writing skills, into their verbal and communi written communication skills, into almost anything. It's the kind of the touching between the heart and the mind which, which good young students uh, are able to achieve. And if, and if you are able to uh, prioritize in your communication, certainly with all students, but most particularly with double degree students, this interest in, in, in all you, although you don't, uh, you don't kind of dumb down the music. You don't, you, you, perhaps the expectation of the amount of repertoire we do is a little bit reduced because they have very, uh, very challenging academic requirements. But it's more to do with making sure that you are coaching your language in such a way that they will have a glimmer always of knowing that even though they're focusing on something that may not be absolutely applicable to their lives in five or 10 years time, it's generally useful in their life in five or 10 years time. And that's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. You, and if I just continue with one more thing, you mentioned that I had a very rigid uh, conservatory training at a great school, which is true. Um, many folks from my generation who went through that, I think perhaps carry with them the baggage of feeling that that's the kind of teaching that they're all obligated to do. Mm -hmm. um, and out of that, comes perhaps the occasional mistrust of a double degree student about knowing, well, am I really living up to the responsibilities of studying with this person? Mm -hmm. and it's really, really important that you communicate that it's okay for them to be using music in their lives for whatever purpose they want. And I will be just as pleased if their lives when they're 30 or 35 or 40 have nothing to do with music but that the study of music has in some way enriched their ability to be happy in other fields. That's every much as I have, I have some students who are playing principal bassoon in major orchestras. Mm -hmm. 
Sure, that's great. I have many students who have quit playing the bassoon and are doing other things. And those people make me just as happy, provided that the experience has has ended up being enriching to them in a, in a very broad sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of broadcasting, so we talked about mm -hmm. podcast, um, you played in the last remaining radio orchestra in North America, CBC. I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The end of a long legacy. You played there for about 28 years, I believe. Uh, I played in the CBC Orchestra for a mere 25 years, oh, okay. uh, which was on top of 29 years that I spent with the sister orchestra, the Vancouver Symphony. Um, and about half of us in the radio orchestra were also involved in the symphony. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a great long tradition for those uh, those of you, of your listeners who may not know this, and it's easily forgotten. If you went back to the 50s and 60s and 70s in Canada, we had uh, CBC orchestras in a number of cities from Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, Vancouver. And these were very Im important institutions uh, because they filled content on the radio and they were hugely important to the community. For whatever reason, uh, Vancouver Radio Orchestra at CBC somehow continued for a couple of decades longer than any of the others. And boy, it was so it was truly a wonderful experience, and I it 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 trained me to um, to be versatile and very quick mm -hmm. in learning because often we would have on top of the symphony we would often have fifteen or eighteen services a week. I mean, I would often have three or four days where I would be morning and afternoon recording sessions with the radio orchestra, and then go to the Orpheum Theater in Vancouver to do a symphony concert. And we got through a lot of material and I had to learn to be a quick study. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I'm we're very blessed with that. And I'm sorry that that experience is not available to anyone anymore. It was an amazing yeah. opportunity to get through a lot of repertoire. And you had to kind of, you know, the red light would come on and you had between 10 and one, you had to get this amount of music done. And when the, when the light went off at one o'clock, that was it. And God help you if you didn't have it done. Yeah. And you were quite young when you started doing that in your career. Well, I, uh, yeah, I started in the Symphony of Vancouver when I was 22. And really, I, I did, could hardly play an F major scale. I don't know how on earth they hired me. Uh, so I had a lot of on-the-job on training. And, you know, after a few years, started to figure out what you do. Mm -hmm. I, and... mean, I mean that very, very sincerely. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea how I was hired. Well, I think a lot of us... It's not imposter syndrome when we're young, right? I mean, I felt the same way um, too. Because... Well, they call it they call it imposter syndrome, but but I think it's probably a, a, he a healthy part of our yeah. of our learning responsibility when we're when we're young. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that for you as a double reed player, which a lot of listeners won't realize, is the making of reeds, which is a mm -hmm. whole is a whole thing. It's a whole artistry. The whole yeah, it is. <laughs> It's it's hard to it's hard to come up with a with a metaphor of just the importance of it. I, I think if you were a violinist and you said, well, you have to make a bow every month and you have to rehair that bow every week. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and you have to be responsible for if you don't rehair your bow properly, you're not going to make a pretty sound. You know, and you and if you don't make your if you don't make the bow, it, it's that kind of a difficulty. Um, and it's it's an annoyance. Uh, which never quite leaves us. <laughs> but over the years, uh, if you survive uh, week after week of having to sound pretty much yourself, no matter what tortures you're going through, you do come to terms with it fairly early on. Uh, mm -hmm. And you either do or you don't. And there are people who simply don't and they, they give up. Because it can be that, it's that critical to how well we play that we make reads well. Uh, you can't play in tune, you can't finesse uh, dynamics. You you can't make a beautiful sound. There's basically nothing you can do if you don't have good reads, and you can't go to the you can't go to the corner store and buy them. Yeah, I played oboe for five years as a teenager, and I did you know have some forays into trying to make reads, and it was just an exercise in frustration. Yeah. And but it was interesting to me that your teacher at Curtis didn't um, make his own reads, and you were saying that no. generation. Yeah. Of that generation. So I, I studied with a very famous bassoonist uh, who had um, come into uh, prominence before the Second World War and was, a, was with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And he came from a generation of players where 
capital A, artists did not bother with this mundane stuff, so somebody would make reads for them. And often these great players really didn't have a clue about what to do with their own reads. They played wonderfully, but they really did rely upon other people to, to do the work for them. This evolved drastically in the 1960s. And so by the time I was a serious student in the early 70s, you know, it, there was just no way that you weren't going to master read making yourself. No way. So you went and studied uh, read making with Lou Skinner? Oh, you've done your research. Can you imagine that there were actually people, and not very many of them, in, in, there was one or two of them in the United States in the 70s, uh, who actually specialize in teaching young bassoonists how to make reeds. If you can imagine, uh, after my first uh, year at Curtis, getting onto a bus way, way up northeast into on, the, on the coast of Maine in a tiny little fishing village not far from the Canadian border lived a man named Lewis Skinner, who had been a bassoonist, of course, and had found his niche as a reed maker for professionals and later on found his niche as, as a teacher of reed making. And it's hard to be believe, A, that I would do this, and yet it's also hard to believe that that there was only one man doing it at the time because it was important to all of us. Mm -hmm. So there I was, and I made several trips, week-long trips up there, and uh, he organized my approach to reed making. Although my thinking about how reeds and bassoons function only began to evolve after that period. Mm -hmm. And it became quite important to me to actually understand uh, how the whole darn mechanism works, which is not a knowledge that's actually of interest to most players. Yeah, so I, I found your uh, your series of articles, um, brains, what is it, brains and membranes about <laughs> the, the yes. acoustic, the physics of all this. And as a violinist, I really appreciate it actually you're, you had this diagram of the waveform um, of, you know, the note, the harmonic nodes on a violin string, which I had a vague understanding of, but never really, no one had ever explained this to me until I read your article, actually. Ah. So, yeah, wonderful. And I, I'll put a link for that. I mean, it's, I, I'm not a, I'm fascinated by science, but I, I have a little resistance. I had to reread some of this stuff. But if you could explain to the listeners mm -hmm. how the, bassoon read acts as a valve and what it would be like if we were tiny and inside that valve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing is, is that you assume, uh, everyone who plays a, a reed instrument assumes and operates under the assumption that you have a reed which makes the sound and, and the instrument somehow magically transforms that sound into whatever piece of music you're playing. It's like a kind of a one-way street. And this makes sense because psychologically we are dealing with always blowing out through out through our lips into an instrument mm. and right in between us and the instrument is this silly little valve valve which which sounds if i uh I'll show you has this kind of a squeaky sound <laughs> now how that turns into the mozart bassoon concerto is not built into uh into the into the material of the reed itself. This is made out of a out of a kind of cane, which we generally uh, get from cane grown in France. Although there are places in the in the Americas and South America and Australia where you get this stuff, uh, it grows in a swamp and it grows you know sixteen feet high. It's like a bamboo relative. I can tell you that there's absolutely nothing in the hundreds of millions of years of the evolution of the DNA of that plant that tells it anything about how to play the Mozart bassoon concerto. Now, I, I, I'm being a little bit silly, but this idea that everything comes from the reed and goes out is as silly as to think that you as a violinist, that the instrument is meaningless. What really matters is the hair on your bow, that that makes the sound. Mm -hmm. Violinists don't think this way. Sure, you value the quality of a bow, but you I don't think a, a violinist ever assumes that the sound that you get, the actual musical tone, is coming from the hair. And yet, that is kind of how bassoonists and oboists and clarinetists think, that the sound is coming from the material. Well, in fact, the sound is coming from the air column in the instrument, just as the sound of a violin 
comes from the vibration of the top plate and bottom plate of the of the violin interacting with the space uh, they co contained air with inside the sound sound is pressure waves and our experience of sound is how we how we interact with the concept of music music is all these pressure waves are hitting so if you think very in a very reductive sense it becomes very helpful to to, to understand that what's going on in a violin bow and what's going on in a bassoon reed are similar in the sense that they are kind of a feedback mechanism mm -hmm. let me give you a really easy way to think of this i think anyone who doesn't play an instrument never knows if they, if they've ever if attended a concert they sometimes hear where a violinist play what's called a pizzicato where you just pluck a string and that sound does not sustain but it has a musical quality and it has a pitch and it can even have a volume and quality and all that is is an excitation a brief excitation of the string and the string presses down on the bridge and that vibration is transferred into the body of the violin which amplifies and resonates and projects a uh, pressure wave or series of pressure waves which we hear briefly as a musical tone you know you can make a pizzicato on a bassoon and i'll show you okay so here we have a bassoon and it's a big long instrument we won't get too much into detail but i wanted to show that you can actually make a pizzicato and how you do it is you see this is what we call a vocal and the reed sits here at the end of the vocal. And I was talking a minute ago about how this becomes the energy generator. And now we need to talk and explain how it becomes a reactive energy generator. So Chris, for those people listening who can't see it, can you describe the vocal? The vocal looks like a shepherd's crook. If you hold it a certain way, yeah. Uh, looks like a question mark, I suppose. And the question is, is why are you doing this for a living? But <laughs> that's essentially what it is. But but look. Well, it's metal. I, it, it's a metal tube. It's metal. It's metal, yeah. and it's attached to an instrument, which is yeah. largely wood. Yeah. But I, although there's normally a reed sitting here, mm -hmm. if I just blow in the end, all you hear is rushing air, right? But if I slap my tongue against the end of the of this vocal. If I slap my tongue, you can hear a pitch. And here I change my fingerings. Can you hear a chromatic scale emerging? I just played a chromatic scale from a low B up to an F sharp without a reed. And that is acoustically identical to what you're doing on the pizzicato. Because what I'm doing is I'm doing a simple input of energy. Mm -hmm. And this air column has a propensity to set up back and forth waves, sound mm -hmm. waves. And they want, they want to send up back and forth sounding waves at the speed of sound at a frequency determined by how many fingers you've got closed down. So if I close down all of the holes on the bassoon to create a really low pitch just a minute here here's a low b with a reed here's a low b with a staccato like a pizzicato and here is actually almost the same sound with no reed just by exciting in a pizzicato fashion, the bore of the bassoon. Same pitch. Okay, so the challenge that we have as bassoonists, and the challenge that you have as a violinist, is how do you get from a simple quick pizzicato or a slap of the tongue against the open end of the bassoon, how do you get from that to a sustained tone? And therein lies years of heartache for the bassoonist is figuring out what you basically have here is is a little double read which has to react to the information coming back now if i could slap my tongue against the read at this same frequency 
as the note that wants to resonate, which in this case is about 40, uh, about 62 vibrations per second for a low B, something like that. If I could slap my tongue 62 times a second, which is, of course, physically impossible, even for Superman, nevertheless, if I could coordinate that 62 times a second with the 62 times a second that the vibrations in the bassoon want, want naturally to do, then I would create a bassoon sound just with my fast tongue. It's a little like if you could make a pizzica, if you played a tuning A on the violin and, you're, and the string is vibrating, moving back and forth 440 times a second. Mm. If you could move your finger 440 times a second, keep supplying pizzicato, you would sustain a long tone mm. on the violin. Now, it's not possible. So what mm. you do is you get a bow, which has a hair, a hair on it, and the hair is rough, and the hair grabs microscopically the string of the violin, and it basically is grabbing and releasing microscopically mm -hmm. at the same same rate as the string is vibrating. So you're drawing your bow, and 440 times a second, if you zero in with a microscope, the string is grabbing, the, the excuse me, the bow hair is grabbing the string and sustaining that pizzicato into long tone. And because my tongue won't, won't move 440 times a second, what I have to do is I come up with a mechanism that will react. So we build out of cane a little pressure valve. And it is capable of responding to this back and forth vibrations inside the instrument. The actual sound, it's capable of sustaining that by being responsive at the correct frequency to that sound. Does that kind of make any sense to you? It, it does. And so people, like what you explained in that article is that the read, it's it's opening and close. It's not just, um, I think a lot of us just picture the air is just going through and it's, you know, the way that... No, it, it's not it's not one directional. Yeah, that's what it's I want. It's bi-directional. So yeah. it goes this way and it comes this way. And you think, wait a minute, are you saying that a sound wave, an instrument goes back and forth and it can do it 440 times a second? How can that be? Well, speed of sound at sea level is like 700 and something miles an hour, and it's mm -hmm. not going that far. This process happens very, very, very quickly. Yeah. And since you have your bassoon close to you, a couple of yeah. other questions. For one thing, you're a woodwind technician as well, mm -hmm. right? So you, I don't, I'm not even sure what you do with when you when you uh, fix up clarinets and flutes. So you're dealing with the keys. These mechanisms mm -hmm. are quite complex, aren't they? Yeah, beautiful. I mean, you look at them, there's pieces of metal mm -hmm. that are mounted onto the wood of the bassoon through mounting posts, and they have hinges and screws mm -hmm. and things which allow these mechanisms to control something like, um, like here, I'm working <laughs> backwards here, see right here, mm -hmm. that round thing is a cup, mm -hmm. and it covers a hole almost as big. And that hole helps to determine how long the air column is and therefore what frequency the all that interactive process occurs and therefore out of that what pitch we hear mm -hmm. what note do we hear mm -hmm. so what has to happen when you, with mm -hmm. the instruments is that these mechanisms go out of adjustment mm -hmm. and the holes themselves here if you look um, let me find one that's a little bit clearer to see here. Right there, mm -hmm. you can see this is yep. the bottom tone of the instrument. Mm -hmm. There's the hole underneath, mm -hmm. and there's the metal of the key. And in between this is white stuff. It's a leather pad. And the mm -hmm. leather pad, when you press it down, and if it's set up properly, mm -hmm. it will very evenly seal up the board of the bassoon so there's no air leakage. Mm -hmm. These things age and go out of adjustment. So it's yeah. a constant process of taking care of that. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's adjusting the mechanisms so that they have the right degree of stiffness or looseness. And then the really interesting stuff is getting into the actual dimensions of the tone holes and the bore itself and making subtle adjustments so that, for example, my dear colleague in the National Arts Center Orchestra, the principal clarinet 
Kimball Sykes. I've worked on his instruments hundreds and hundreds of times over the years. And we have often done little adjustments with reamers and things, changing the tone hole sizes just a little bit, because he would come and say, I'm sorry, I just can't get up to pitch on this A. The tone hole's not quite right. So there's a lot of that stuff, and it becomes mm. very challenging and very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, one more question since your bassoon's close. One thing you demonstrated on one of these podcasts was how difficult it is to get from a high A to a high B in the bassoon. And your description of the fingering kind of blew my mind. I couldn't believe how complicated it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem with the bassoon, um, which I like to think is of a whole different order of magnitude than any of the other winds, is what the poor thumbs have to do. Mm -hmm. Now, right next to me here, you see this is the back of the bassoon kind of mm -hmm. halfway up. Okay. And you see all these keys. Mm -hmm. You know how many fingers operate those keys? I'm guessing your One. two thumbs. Oh, really? One. One thumb. Wow. My left thumb has to operate all of those keys. Can you, can you imagine the flexibility in your thumb? Now, if we go a little further down the bassoon, you see this array of, there are five keys here. Mm -hmm. One, actually there's six. One, two, three. I'm going backwards so you can see yeah. that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's even one more right here. Mm -hmm. And that's all for the right thumb. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is, is that you have to have uh, kind of a, a willingness to throw your tongue, uh, th throw your, <laughs> your tongue, throw your thumb to the, to the mercies of, of these keys millions of times over decades and then eventually one of the things that happens to older bassoonists is our thumbs start to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I, I always, always say, Leah, that um, people who say I can't play a musical instrument because I'm all thumbs. Well, I have an instrument for them to play. <laughs> now, your first instrument was the piano, and you played mm -hmm. jazz piano as as a young teenager. I did. I did. I ch attempted to, and I loved it. And the great thing about studying jazz as a teenager is it got me off to a real head start in terms of understanding harmony. Yes, which must be such a benefit to being one of the bass instruments in the orchestra, too. It, it is. I think it's really important to say, and to say it publicly, <laughs> that the average jazz musician has a far, far deeper and more sophisticated understanding of harmony than any classical musician's. Of course. And it, because in real time, they have to know where they are. They have to know their modes and their scales and, they, and their substitutions. And it's an extraordinary uh, gift to learn that early on. And mm -hmm. it helped me enormously. Uh, when I mentioned early in our conversation how important it was when in a radio orchestra to be a quick learner, mm -hmm. Uh, being able to look at a piece of music and see four or five notes and be able to say those, aren't, I don't have to learn those notes sequentially. Mm -hmm. I look at the notes and I say, ah, they fit into a pattern with which I'm familiar. Yeah. That skill is curiously challenging to many young classical artists, that ability to simply see uh, what is the context of the passage that they're playing. Mm -hmm. So often I will ask a student, you have seven notes here, what scale are you playing? And it'll take them 20 minutes to figure out and they should be able to see it like that. That's often because scales, in, in, as we have to execute them, are rarely starting on the first note yeah. and running eight notes up an octave. And especially if you get into minor scales and 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 yeah. modal forms and octatonic scales and so, if, if you have a note that is, that's, if you have a scale that begins with a minor second, a half step, mm -hmm. you're immediately confused because there aren't any scales that from what we call root position, where this, where we normally see a scale, the bottom to the top, and they don't begin with minor seconds. They begin with a major second. So yeah. the minute that you can see a minor second, you're, aha, in my experience, I can visualize where I am and I don't have to practice the passage because I hook in the neurons, hook into something in the brain which has a familiarity in a holistic way with the understanding of what that whole scale looks like and the execution of the partial scale becomes far easier. And yeah. I cannot tell you, you know this, you're a ex very, very experienced high level musician, so you know this, uh, younger players don't get this. And they often yeah. spend a tremendous amount of time learning uh, sequentially from A through Z. I have several videos on this topic actually about okay. 
like so, yeah, yeah, I think it's very important. So so about jazz though. So you, part of your drive must have been the joy of improvisation. Yes. And, yes. So yes. do you improvise on the bassoon? No. <laughs> okay. Not not in the sense that you're asking. Mm-hmm. But do I play in an improvisational sense every day? Yes, it, I I don't ever warm up with the same repeated patterns. Mm-hmm. I warm up every time I will do a, do something and I will immediately transpose it into a bunch of different keys. So I improvise in the sense that I'm always exercising my fluency in the scales and modes that as I just described them. So mm-hmm. there's improvisation in that sense, but certainly not in the sophisticated sense of interpretations of chordal changes in the way that jazz musicians do. If I sit at a piano, yes, but not on the bassoon. And do you still play jazz piano? poorly (laughs) and now that you're going to be retiring from the nac orchestra are you Mm -hmm. going to maybe compose uh arrange maybe uh Mm -hmm. and you know in a in for pedagogical projects but no no, i don't i i think that uh, composition is a skill that requires a tremendous amount of dedication and i think i would be only a dilettante as a as a composer. But I will now say publicly, and you will be the first to hear this, that um, after I'm finished with my uh, constant obligations to the bassoon next year, the first thing I'm going to purchase is the instrument that I started with as a teenager, and I'm going to buy an alto saxophone, and I'm going to start working on my jazz improvisation chops as a way of keeping myself cognitively challenged and active. Uh, The reason I haven't done it for the last 55 years is that I personally found it difficult to maintain any sense of what we call the embouchure, the subtlety of control of a little reed like a bassoon reed. If I was going back and forth to a saxophone, some people can do it but I sure couldn't. So once I no longer have the obligation of intonation and sound production on the bassoon, Mm -hmm. then I think I will let myself go. What a fun project. That's wonderful to hear. I hope so. It's so hard for musicians to retire in any sense, I think. For most of us, because we're playing with people at such a high level. I think it's hard to let go of that. It is. I had lunch with a dear friend yesterday who was saying, so as so many people have asked me, how are you feeling about retirement? And uh, I said to this person yesterday, well, of course, I have mixed feelings because I know absolutely that arithmetic doesn't lie. And I'm at the point where I cannot sustain a level for much longer. Mm. I will miss it terribly. And the statement about I will miss it terribly, how blessed are we to have Mm. lived a life where when we're retiring, we say, I'm really going to miss it. The realities of lots and lots of people are so relieved not to be capital W working mm-hmm. that retirement, provided it's adequately funded, becomes you know a real re- release. But as you say, it's a little bit more difficult for us because we're letting go of something that we love, reluctantly, uh, and and we all will need cognitive challenges mm-hmm. to maintain something for the remaining decades and also as orchestral players we're part of a team it's that feel that, you know which we've missed during this pandemic so much that's for sure yeah. it's very hard to describe i mean i know symphony audiences uh understand because they're th- those who are regular listeners i think really partake in that in that miracle of 50 or 75 people somehow achieving unanimity of purpose um uh, it's not always cl- always as clean and as miraculous as it might appear. Sometimes it's messy internally, but mostly it's not. Mostly it's kind of a miracle, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, a, a kind of a utopian vision of how people can work together. It, it often is, mm-hmm. and I I don't think that's naivety. Just, I've been playing. This would be f- forty seven years playing in in orchestra, and while there are ups and downs, and the quality is not always A plus. Nevertheless, uh, it's pretty miraculous. So mm-hmm. what? Uh, how lucky are you and I, huh? Yeah. And a key to that, of course, is the guy or the woman on the podium. Mm-hmm. And you have, I think, more... You have a great deal of perceptiveness about conductors, I've, I've noticed. You're always watching very carefully. And I think 
of course, I think you've just worked with a lot of conductors, but I was thinking, well, he doesn't have a million notes to play like I do. And, and like mm -hmm. you're right in front of the person as well. So you have them straight on and not like when you're sitting at the back of the violins, we get this kind of awkward side view that's peripheral. Yeah. Not that I, I, of course, I watch the conductor constantly and my section leader, but I think it is a different perspective. Like you're right there. You're yes, in the yes. center, in the heart of the orchestra. You can hear everything. And you were even um, on the um, key to selecting our, our music director. Like you, you're really, oh, yes. you, you're friends with conductors, which I don't think is that usual with orchestra musicians. No, well, you know, they need friends. It's not an easy, easy job. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, it can be very isolating, which is ironic considering that mm. they're always in the midst of a group of people. But it's very, it's a very, very difficult job. Yes, I, I, it's very perceptive of you to say I, I don't have as many notes to play, and therefore I am able to be a little bit more observant. And the physical space on the stage where woodwinds sit, as you say, is central. It does give us a perhaps a more balanced view than than you get. Um, but that doesn't mean that I necessarily. Um, would be any more skilled at defining for you or an, or defining for a non-musician what's a, what makes a good conductor. Mm -hmm. It's remarkably elusive. And it's so elusive, Leah, that if you as a orchestra musician are not performing and you go sit in an audience at your orchestra or any other orchestra with a conductor that you are, have no familiarity with and you're looking at this person from behind, it's almost impossible to know whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. Now, it may sound great, but if you've got a whole bunch of really great musicians who are familiar with repertoire, they're going to sound good. Yeah. So what, what is the, what is, is, when does the, uh, you know, the sum exceed the parts and, and all that. And it's very hard to know when you, it, even from physical presence, you actually need to be, having the sight line, you need to see the eyes, you need to feel the flow of energy back and forth on stage to really know what's working or doesn't, which why is why I'm always amused when I see critics writing about concerts or people writing about, oh, this, you know, this conductor is, is great and this conductor is mediocre or this concert is good. They, they often, I, bless their hearts, I wouldn't be able to write any better than they, they are. And I'm experienced doing it. Mm -hmm. It's really an elusive craft mm -hmm. and I have uh, if I have a different perspective on conductors is I have a sympathy for them generally because I think it's very difficult to do mm -hmm. and you have coached the National Youth Orchestra of Canada for many many years yes so, I was there for 20 years yeah yeah so these young players especially wind players I imagine they wouldn't have that much orchestra experience and they come into this fabulous National Orchestra for the summer mm -hmm. What kind of work do you do with them and what kind of things do you impart to them? It's been so long since I, I was there because I taught there mm. all during the 80s and 90s. So I haven't been there, but nothing has changed. Yeah. And the answer the answer I give you now is what I would have given uh, mm -hmm. when I was involved in Thicket Thin. The National Youth Orchestra of Canada has a particular philosophy and a, a working protocol that, that has made it so successful. And it's a model of how the allocation of time for students is split between one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, instruction, between participation in small groups, like, for example, a first violin section, and then at a next level to a group of string players playing together, and then finally to full orchestra. It's kind of a tiered rehearsal structure, which um, allows for the assimilation of new repertoire in a very organized way and allowing, allowing students to get past the initial fear and lack of familiarity with the notes on the page to learn for themselves how to play it, to learn how to play with the person beside them, mm -hmm. to learn how to play with the person in people in front and behind, and then to gradually, well, then you move on to a full strict string sectional and you start to understand concepts of the problems of distance on stage and of stylistic differences uh, um, between the different in instrument groups and of, of the, the you know double basses and cellos often have different bowing challenges than than violins or or perhaps violas do. You learn that, and then the miracle of full wind and brass joining in that whole that whole hierarchical structure of learning has been particularly uh, proved to be ben beneficial to young Canadians over the last fifty years. It has, in, as you're right, has been a blessing. Mm -hmm. So in your own studies, you were at uh, the esteemed Curtis Institute, 
And mm. I noticed in your bio, you also studied with the French flutist Marcel Moïse. I did. So this is a name which is probably only familiar to, um, to flutists and unfortunately less familiar now than, than that name would have been 40 years ago to every young flutist. But um, just as every young violinist should know who Leopold Auer was mm -hmm. and who Leopold Auer taught, who is your great great grand teacher and the teacher of your grand teacher, that kind of uh, lineage, the ancestor knowledge and the progeny knowledge moving down. So Moise was a um, flutist of the really born of the 19th century. He was born in the 1880s and he, uh, he knew Debussy, he knew Ravel, uh, he played the premiere of the Debussy trio. I mean, he was played, he played the first performances of Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe. I mean, that whole tradition. He came to the United States um, around the time of the uh, Second War, and, and he settled in outside of Marlborough mm -hmm. in Vermont, uh, where there's been a very famous festival that I went to when I was a young man. Mm -hmm. um, so what Moïse was, was what we might call the ultimate exemplar of, of a tradition of French wind playing capital F, French wind plane, which was governed by an approach to uh, sound production, musical interpretation, that was significant, significantly different from the European German schools that had predominated up until the early part of the 20th century. Moise and several other very important French musicians, perhaps the most famous, the oboist Marcel Tabuteau in Philadelphia, uh, began to, t to play th themselves in ways that were much more oriented towards emulation of singing. Mm -hmm. Their use of vibrato, and in particular in the oboe, and, and Moïse in particular, the subtlety of the use of what we call tone colors and sonorities, being able to make a very dark sound or a very bright sound, and physically how you do it, mm -hmm. and also understanding artistically the context in which these tools can be used. And the curious thing about Moïse in particular, which was the reason he was important in my life, Leah, was that he represented a very right brain approach to music making. Mm -hmm. And I was studying, you know, at an institute with a very left brain approach. So mm -hmm. what I mean is that I was studying in at Curtis, which was still, and perhaps even to this day, maintains some of the traditions uh, that came from Marcel Tabuteau, the great oboist, where if you analyze how to play a phrase, he actually had a number system. Hmm. And the number system would be like one through five or one through eight in increasing value of intensity or dynamic. Mm -hmm. And if you had a phrase that went in a certain direction, you would actually analyze it to the point of putting number values on it. It's a very reductionist way of thinking. It's, it's mm -hmm. not unmusical. It's mm -hmm. just that it gets to the music making and it gets to communication in music through a more uh, granular way mm -hmm. and incredibly important way to learn and study at some point in every young musician's life. Mm -hmm. Moise, when I went to him, I was already studying at Curtis, Moise was about stories and about ineffable things. Mm -hmm. And it's also about things that changed. That he might say to someone about a very identical passage, one thing on a Thursday, mm -hmm. and on a Friday afternoon teach it in a very different way. Which when you're a young musician and you're impressionable, and you think that you're learning rules and what is correct and what is not mm -hmm. correct, Oh, kind of a, an extraordinary experience to discover that a musician of this caliber would change his mind on a dime. Yeah. So that that became about the connection between uh, the heart mm -hmm. and the mind was achieved not through organization but through poetry, mm -hmm. and musical and poetry. And I'm. I understand uh, what you're saying completely, but I'm wondering also, were you playing so, like solo bassoon things or were you playing chamber music with him? What was the chamber, chamber music? Yes, but his, this, this is very interesting. 
Moise's primary vehicle in working in, with students in master classes and students of, who were not flute players as well mm-hmm. was uh, uh, centered around he he the, although I describe him as sounding like he was just sort of off in the air all about art and poetry. In fact, his own development had been highly structured and he mm-hmm. wrote and published many, many extremely organized books about technique and tone production and wrote very intelligently. Mm-hmm. But my interactions interactions with him were generally past that. And what, what he focused on at a certain level of life was, was a book that he wrote, which he titled, now get this, Tone Production Through Interpretation. Hmm. Tone Production through the interpretation of music. Now that sounds like either the most stupidly mundane thing you've ever thought of, or actually when you think about it, it's a profound uh, amalgam and synthesis of what French woodwind playing was about. What I'm trying to describe here um, is sitting down with someone, the, the idea of tone production through interpretation was a, was a book about how you take simple melodies and learn to emulate the human voice. So the book was all 19th century operatic arias, mm-hmm. mostly Verdi, uh, some Mozart song. It was basically just the great, the great tunes mm-hmm. without words. So in the place of words, Moyes taught sonority and color. Mm-hmm. And lo- uh, teaching us to listen in a very deep way um, so the fact that I was looking for very specific, structural, clear, logical answers, he was able to fill in by saying there are not clear, logical answers sometimes. Sometimes you just have to sing. Mm-hmm. I have on my wall behind me, in his handwriting, two bars of a piece of music, which I think kind of encapsulate all this. There's a very beautiful melody for the bassoon in one of Beethoven's uh, chamber music works. It's the sextet for um, for for winds and two horns. Mm-hmm. And in the second movement, there's this beautiful tune. It's written with it's written in two four time with eighth notes, and it's got a slur over it. Mm-hmm. Now, having studied at Curtis, I was encouraged. The number system, mm-hmm. one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, or something like that. Yeah. And I had been taught, well, there's, a, uh, there's a two notes of the same pitch at the bar line, so I need to distinguish. Mm-hmm. And all these kind of structural ideas. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting next to him. To Moise at a concert, and I was, and we had just studied this, and saying, I was saying, Maestro, I'm very confused about how to do this. Should I make a space at the bar line? What do I put? He just started laughing. And about two hours later, I saw him again. He gave me, I have it up on my wall, he gave me this music written out in paper on staff. And there were the notes, and underneath were the lyrics, and the lyrics were, Let me see your beautiful brown eyes. Oh. <laughs> and it was, let me see your beautiful brown eyes, in which immediately the context of text, mm-hmm. not only in terms of syllabic pronunciation, but in terms of the deeper content, mm-hmm. was illuminated in a way that, for me, thinking very re- in a reductionist way, was not so evident. Mm-hmm. So those of us who had the blessing of studying with him or... Um, perhaps more recently, players like uh, flutists, like the great English fl- flutist William Bennett, who was a Moise, mo- perhaps Moise's most important student and who taught in similar ways. Uh, those of us who have been fortunate have uh, found in our lives, hopefully, someone who would teach us in a very organized way, utilizing and prioritizing what our left brain, if, if you buy the left brain, right brain reductionist holistic argument of the bicameral mind and all that but using that part of our cognition that's organized and granular and how do you bridge the gap into something that's holistic hopefully you have a teacher who can give you the one perhaps both 
or the experience of someone else who suddenly turns on light bulbs in your head about how to take the tremendous value of analysis that you've gained from the one and then apply the magic that you achieve from the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that, sorry, that's a very long answer to who was Marcel Moise. Well, I was, you know, I was fascinated. So I looked him up. I saw he was born in 1889 and, you yeah. know, lived almost 100 years. And I mm -hmm. was I was very interested. And I, of course, you're married to a very well-known flutist, Camille Churchfield, who's also a pedagogue. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, maybe there was that connection. But no, it was it was different. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you've had so many experiences beyond your major orchestras. You also performed with the World Orchestra for Peace and toured with them several times. I did. That started around 2001. I was invited to do that. That orchestra, uh, which has not done any concerts in the last four or five years, and I have not done anything with them mm -hmm. in a few years younger than that, created by George Schulte mm -hmm. uh, back in the 80s. And after he died, uh, Valery Gergiev, the Russian conductor, took over. So I did about six, five or six tours with them, a very interesting organization where people from all over the world were flowing into either London or Moscow or uh, Berlin or wherever and rehearse for three or four days and then go on a short tour. One tour we did, uh, we rehearsed in London and in the space of eight days, rehearsed and played proms in London, the Philharmonie in Berlin, uh, in Moscow and in Beijing, all in the space of eight days so we sort of went, went around the world that was an organization the idea being that um schulte's vision being that musicians could be an example a utopian example of people from different cultures getting getting along just fine which is indeed what happened mm -hmm. and um conducted by Gergiev, the great Russian conductor, who unfortunately in the last few years has been tarred fairly or unfairly with his associations with, with uh, Putin, but nevertheless an, an, an amazingly important uh, conductor and one who stretched my own understanding of what a, conduct, a successful conductor can be and look like. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the reasons why I have become have gained some personal humility about my own assumptions of my ability to evaluate conductors was working with Gergiev, mm -hmm. because when you watched him, it was basically made. Mm -hmm. How do you get the opening of the first chords of the overture to Midsummer Night's Dream, pa, when the conductor does, and you have to do that. Mm -hmm. So for Chris, for, for people listening to the podcast, okay. basically you're just wiggling your all your fingers. <laughs> I'm, no... I'm wiggling my fingers. <laughs> yeah. And and if I was holding anything, I'd be holding a toothpick because he usually would conduct yeah. with a tiny, tiny piece of wood like this, which we all thought was hysterical because, you know, he's got people in front of him with $2 million violins and he's got a 10 cent toothpick that he's conducting. With. So the thing about Gergiev, which is very hard to describe, I mean, He's often criticized for doing too many things, but when he's wonderful, he understands in a way that a lot of conductors don't understand the in the moment mm -hmm. dialogue and yeah. response to what he's getting. Mm -hmm. And while he had very clear ideas of what he was going to do, uh, it was always able to react to what was coming. And I think great, great conductors do become of course, great planners, and they must plan, and they must study. And But I think at a certain point, they can achieve something better when they're able to be flexible and reactive. So my association with the World Orchestra for Peace, my the main thing I gained out of it, apart from a lot of cool trips and meeting some very great players, was uh, kind of understanding a little bit more than I ever had before of how little I understood conducting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I often end these conversations with um, a question about advice for young players, but we did cover that a lot in this conversation. Mm -hmm. But in, I'd refer to that podcast you've done about practicing and, and you talked about how people often just waste time instead of having very focused practicing, which I c couldn't agree with more. So could you just return to that a little bit? Sure. Practice is a very interesting thing because it, it the word rote, R-O-T-E, which, which, which is kind of practicing where you're repeating things over and over and over and over, 
is important because it establishes, quote, muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you do something over again, then your fingers want to do it. Now, it, it is true we have muscle memory, but in fact, we don't actually have muscle memory. We have cognitive knowledge and what rep, rep, repetition does at a physiological level, it's not terribly well understood, but what we understand in this, the trillions of available neuron connections in our brains, every time you do something, that involves an interaction with your body, you are building up a signal pathway and the repetition of a particular sequence of signals produces a chemical response in the brain where that pathway becomes further insulated and becomes more efficient at a level of, probably a level quantum, a quantum level, but certainly a level of which your brain functions repetition so it's not muscle memory it's the it's the understanding that what what you are doing your conscious mind is is creating a environment where your unconscious mind learns through physiology mm -hmm. all of which means that you the if you're building up uh, efficient neural pathways in your brain to be able to execute as a violinist the first two bars of Richard Strauss, Don Juan, that the brain itself, nothing in there knows what's good or bad. So it's very important that we recognize that re repetition of something that's not 100% right is just you're practicing, rote practicing how to do something at a mediocre level. Because whether you call it muscle memory or you use fancy words like myelin sheathing and oligodendrocytes, no matter how what term you use to describe learning, the fact is that we have to be highly aware all the time that we, whatever subconscious processes we are encouraging to become more automatic are being repeated in the best possible manner, which includes intonation and includes quality of sound and includes an awareness of a healthy body position every it's like best practices both physically and musically have to be evident so there's a heightened sense of awareness under which learning becomes efficient and that learning is not so much dependent upon doing something five thousand times but learning about what the difficulty is. And I know that you're a very experienced teacher and you will know that most of what we do at any level, and even at master's degree or doctoral level of teaching, I can tell you, most of what we do is discussing how to learn yeah. and how to practice. And tip, learn, learning how a difficult passage, especially if you're going to spend 25 years in a radio orchestra where you don't have time to learn notes, you have to be able to zero in and identify the weakest link in a in a in the chain that becomes a a passage. Mm -hmm. If you have eight notes together and it's just not working, there will always be a connection between two notes or three notes in that chain yeah. where your neural pathways are inefficient. And once you learn how your brain responds to repetitive practicing and the environment in which you get the best results. Then you learn efficiencies of practice where you can go to the weakest link of a chain, strengthen it on either end, and work out. Have you, Leah, have you noticed how poorly uh, students uh, will practice a passage that they always start at the beginning and move to go to the end? And when you ask a student, no, 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 I'm going to start at the end and work forward. This is your arrival point. You have 11 notes to get there. Okay, don't play one, two, one through 11. Start at 11 and start, then go from 10. Yeah. Then go the last two notes. Or take the passage in the middle, take the fifth, sixth, and seventh notes and play them and add one before and one after. This kind of ability to hone in is how we create an environment in which the subconscious processes achieve results and healthy outcomes in a more efficient way. So that you can do things like go for a walk or drink wine rather than have to do something for an extra six hours.
Yeah. And we need balance. I mean, it's not a joke yeah. about the walk and why. And yeah. so, um, of course, I want to thank you so much for this, this fascinating conversation. So I'm looking forward to playing a few more concerts with you, of course, before you retire. Mm -hmm. What is your last concert you'll be playing with us? Uh, I'm going to finish up in the middle of June with Mahler's First Symphony. Oh, so great. <laughs> yeah, and the week before that is the Rite of Spring, which is a big bassoon solo. Mm -hmm. We're also taking to New York for our Carnegie concert in early April, the, the Ninth Symphony of Shostakovich, which is the oh, biggest yeah. bassoon solo in the entire repertoire. And, you know, I'm hoping that I still have the endurance to get through it and not embarrass myself. We'll see. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much. Great to talk with you, Leah, and I'll see you. I'll see you at work real soon. You will. <laughs> Bye.